morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. I apologize for being a, a minute or two late here. I was talking like the rest of you guys were and looked at my watch and realized, oh, I got to start service here. So it's good to see everybody this morning and just want to say a warm welcome. If you are especially a first time guest or visitor, maybe it's been a long time. Uh, we want to say just we're, how glad we are that you come to join us for worship together and uh, we would love to connect with you, love you to know you a little bit better, and um, hopefully on your way in you received a little uh, a bulletin with a little tear-off sheet inside of that. You can fill that out. You can drop it in one of the offering boxes at any of the doors, and we have a gift that we'd like to give to you if you would do that. Um, but uh, you are an honored guest, and we appreciate you being here. And as well, for those tuning in by way of live stream, we're always excited to hear about those who are part of our services that way, and, um, and so thank you for joining us. Just real quick, a couple quick updates before we'll start into worship. A couple announcements I wanted to, to highlight. Um, again, we've got coming up in just a couple weeks uh, some baby and child dedications. And if you would like to have a baby or child dedicated, um, and that's really, it's, that's moms and dads acknowledging this gift, this child is a gift from the Lord, and we are committing to raise them for the Lord and uh, doing that before the church family. But if you'd like to do that, you can contact the church office during the week hours, and they will get you the information you need. And then also we have coming up on this coming Thursday, uh, a men for missions trip to go help out at Camp Kenesataki um, with uh, some work projects, and we're looking forward to getting down there and giving them a hand. Uh, for those that are going down on Thursday, uh, there's going to be a group that's going to meet here at 7.30 in the morning, and then head over and then get started working as soon as we get down there. Um, and so if you'd like to carpool, you can meet here at 7.30, and we'll head down together and uh, hopefully get a lot of work done. Bring your tools with you and those things, and we'll get them loaded up. And there's also a baptism uh, service coming up in a few weeks, and uh, it's been exciting. We've been meeting with different folks that are interested in getting baptized, and so if you'd like to also get baptized, you can, all, you can let one of us know, one of the pastors know, uh, or contact the church office also. There's other notes in the bulletin, things are taking place, and uh, we want you to not miss those. A quarterly business meeting this week, uh, seniors prayer time uh, on Tuesday. Um, there's also, um, we're going to be doing a makeup for the spring cleaning day. That was supposed to be a spring work day yesterday um, with doing mulching and flower beds and raking and different things, and uh, with the weather that got uh, change to a different date, and so we'll notify you uh, once that date is reset. But so good to have everybody here with us this morning. Uh, let's let's stand to our feet if we could, and we're going to pray together, and then we'll we'll sing and worship the Lord. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to gather together, to hear your word preached, to be able to encourage each other as believers, to grow together in Christ. Lord, we recognize that the church. Believers gathering together is your plan, your institution. It's the body of Christ, and what a privilege to be a part of that. I pray this morning as we gather together to, to sing, to hear Scripture, and to read Scripture together, and to hear preaching, and everything that's done, I pray, Lord, that you'd get glory, uh, that you'd be pleased. Lord, that we would be able to mold and shape our lives to your word and be encouraged together in our walks with you. And so, Father, we thank you for what you're doing and each one of us individually, uh, that, that our, our relationship with you is not just in a corporate sense, but it is personal, it's private, in a relational sense that we have with you. But God, we also thank for how you're working in the, in the corporate body of the church and the things that you're doing here and uh, seeing people come to know Christ and desire to get baptized and see people growing and being discipled and seeing ministries that are taking place and even our missions that we support around the world and uh, God, I just pray that you continue using First Baptist for your glory. We give you the praise for everything you're doing. Lord, we look forward to the soon return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us to stay fixed our eyes upon him, expectant, looking forward to that day. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's lift our voices together as we sing the solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest way, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ's solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground. This is 
scripture reading today is Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 through verse 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever, and the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word, Lord, that we can discern right from wrong from the words that you've given to us in your word. Lord, we, we pray as we go through your word and read your, read your scriptures that we would use it each and every day in our lives. Lord, that we would look for opportunities around us and in the people that you put in our lives, that we would use those opportunities to witness to further your kingdom. 
Lord, we take this time also to think of those who are hurting in our church, Lord, those who are uh, recovering from surgeries, who are sick, Lord, who are going through different struggles. Uh, Lord, you know where they're at, and you are the ultimate healer, and we pray that you would heal them in the ways that they need, and uh, just reach into their lives, Lord, and let them know that you're there, that any trouble we have, we can lay at your feet, and uh, that we can look to you for all the things that, we, uh, that befall us in our daily lives. Lord, I pray for the message today, that it would uh, be encouraging, and Lord, that we would uh, use the words brought to us by our pastor to, uh, to strengthen our hearts and to, to love you more, that it would uh, strengthen our love for you, and we would use it in our daily lives. And I pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing, This is my Father's Word. This is my Father's world.
you're seated and dismissed, we'll, I mean, as you're seated, we'll go ahead and dismiss children for Children's Church this morning as well. Thanks for the clarification on that. I thought he was dismissing you all <laughs> before I got to preach. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's slow this horse down. Well, I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to two places actually to start out for this morning. Uh, if you want to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 17, and then also to 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. And we're going to be looking at those in just a couple minutes. Um, we finished up just a few weeks ago our study through the epistles of John, and uh, generally what uh, we've been doing the last few years is in our, before we start in the next book study of the Bible, is to pause and consider a doctrine together. And um, that way we are periodically, um, over time, studying doctrines together, uh, understanding, looking into Scripture, what it teaches on these different aspects. And so today, uh, and for this week and next week, we're going to pause and consider the doctrine of the Bible. It's known as bibliology. What is the what should we be thinking about when we think about the Bible? Can we trust it? Can we know it is true? Um, and I want to attempt to answer that question of, is the Bible a book that I can completely trust and that it is authority for my life? And so we'll be looking at that. This week will be a little bit more of a um, more declar declaration of what do we believe about this. And I want to look a little bit more next week into... Uh, more of defending that. Why do we believe this? And um, more of an apologetic aspect this week. But there is, this is really the, a crucial question for us in our culture. It's a crucial question for believers, for the church, of what do we believe about the Bible. And it comes down to determining really three things that we're going to kind of dive into today. One is on the matter of inspiration. Did the Bible come to us from God? Is, is that from Him? And then it comes down to is, then also is what he spoke accurate? Can I trust it? Can I trust what the Bible says? And that would be the inerrancy of Scripture. And then lastly, if, if it is his word, is it authoritative for my life? Does it have the right to direct my life and that I should mold myself after what the Bible teaches? You know, the Bible is the best-selling uh, book uh, of all times. It's the most translated book of all times. It's in right now currently in over 4,500 languages and translators are continually working on um, putting that into more languages. Right now there's about 2,000 more translation projects that are taking place uh, because it's most, it is, is widely recognized around the world uh, as the most significant uh, book of all time. It's arguably the oldest book in human history that claims to be from the same God who made the universe. But that's not primarily, these, those facts that I just gave are not primarily where the, the heat of this debate really comes in or the substance that is going to give us the reliability to it. Just because it's widely publicized or widely translated doesn't, isn't the determination of its veracity. But the, the, and so the, the, the challenge to it today and the contention in our culture is if it can be discredited or be doubted. Is it truly 100% true in the Word of God? Um, and, if, and if liberals or critics can, can cause us to doubt its origin, its perfection and authority, then really what they can do is they can replace it as the absolute truth for our lives and replace that with whatever truth that they want that to be which is generally themselves. Generally, they want to have the determination of what is rights and wrongs, morals, based upon their own standard. That's what it comes down to, is authority. It comes down to a battle over truth, and really what it comes down to is a battle over sovereignty, and is God, God in our lives. I was reading on this topic and studies and preparations, and I came across an address by philosopher and author Michael Novak back in actually in 1994 he was 
are receiving a prize, the, the Templeton Prize. It's a prize that's honoring uh, entrepreneurs of the Spirit. And, and he spoke this. I'm going I'm to put up on the screens. The, he gave this statement um, in, in kind of a, in a national sense. But I want you to think of this as well in even a, a spiritual sense. Here's what he wrote back in 1994. He said, during the past hundred years, the question for those who loved liberty was whether, relying on the virtues of our peoples, we could survive powerful assaults from without, as in the, the Battle of Britain and so on. And then during the next hundred years, the question for those who love liberty is whether we can survive the most insidious and duplicitous attacks from within, from those who undermine the virtues of our people, doing in advance the work of the father of lies. And here's what they state. There is no such thing as truth. They teach even the little ones. Truth is bondage. Believe what seems right to you. There are as many truths as there are individuals. Follow your feelings. Do as you please. Get in touch with yourself. Do what feels comfortable. And those who speak in this way prepare the jails of the 21st century and they do the work of tyrants. Now, think about what he's stating there. That the, that the pressure that is now an internal that to destroy our country and to destroy society and our culture is not the biggest threat, isn't the external wars and, and nuclear weapons. It's internal. That if the virtues of this country can withstand the internal uh, toil and struggle. And, the, and, the, and the, the battle is from the father of lies questioning truth. And whether it's not just do as you please. There, and it's, all truth is relative. There are as many, many elements of truth as there are people. And that was in 1994. But do you consider, understand how he reached the conclusion as he states at the end, this type of philosophy will be what, what will be filling the jails and what is the movement of tyrants. Do you understand why he says that? Because if you remove the, a, a standard of truth, when the debates are happening in our culture and in our world today, if you, if you remove that there is a standard of truth, then, it, then what do you have left as what is the authority? Power. Might makes right. The loudest voice becomes what is the authority. And therefore then, if we can force you, then you must believe this. This must be right. If we can be the loudest voice, then this must be what is right. And no longer is it that there is a God who is determined this. No longer is it, it doesn't matter what I think, it matters what he thinks. Right? And so, so there's where that comes down to. That's why it's not by accident that a few years back, the Oxford English Dictionary chose as its word that we remember from that year as post-truth. There, there is this movement away from truth and a movement away from an authority of truth. That's why bibliology is so, inc so incredibly crucial and important for the church to understand. And so, I, I like the way um, Stephen Meyer, a theologian, he put it this way. He said, the heart cannot exalt in what the mind rejects. Think about that. The heart cannot exalt what the mind rejects. If we can reason away the veracity of Scripture... And the God who penned it to us, the heart cannot exalt in Scripture and cannot exalt in the God of Scripture. And so it's important that we do not, do not reject that. So let me start with this. I want to start with um, our, our statement of faith as a church. And then I want, I want to read two texts with you from Scripture that we're going to be looking at again on this and kind of looking at then what we believe. And our doctrinal position as a church states this. We believe in the verbal inspiration, inerrancy, and absolute and final authority of the Scriptures as originally given. We believe God has preserved His Word through all generations and that His Word remains pure and inerrant yet today in those 66 books of the Old and New Testament and that they are co the completed revelation of God for us today. It's also really tied to the first Baptist distinctive of biblical authority which states that the Bible is our only authority for all matters of belief and behavior so we believe that the bible is inspired by god inerrant and is the 
is the standard for us in all matters of our belief and practice of our lives. But with that in mind, let's look at two scriptures. I ask you to open your Bibles, first of all, to 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses 16 and 17. And here Paul is trying to encourage Timothy as he's going to be kind of passing on the baton, so to speak. And he's told him, re- remember, that you've, remember your, your sound faith that you've been taught and that you've heard. And, uh, and then he tells him in verse 14 to 17, but you must continue in the things that you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from a childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so he's telling them, no matter what society is doing, hold the line, study the scriptures, trust the scriptures. This is the word of God given to us. And this is what will change your life. And then Paul also reiterates that in the other text I had you turn to, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, in verse 13, as he's reiterating this to the, to the Thessalonians, the church of Thessalonica, And he says in verse 13, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So Paul is affirming in his and it's absolute, and this is not just a word from man. This isn't just concocted by human reasoning. It isn't just God, or isn't it that this was just penned down by people. This was given to us by God. And will affect us and effectively works in those who believe. And so what I want to do is kind of lay down this morning some thoughts with you on this. Three basic and critical beliefs that we need to start with. And uh, there'll be a little bit of reasoning in this. Um, we'll get into a little bit more of that next week of why do we believe this. Hope this won't be just simply like an ex- educational lecture, but, but, but will be encouraging and challenging to us in our, our affirming and, and desire for the Word of God. So let's have a quick word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll dive into that. Father, thank you for your Word. Thank you for not only that you've revealed it to us and you've chosen to help us to to know you and how to have a right relationship with you and to know the gospel and all the the element of what your son has come to do and is going to still yet come to do because we have your word. God, I pray that we would understand that we can trust it, understand and see the, 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 the magnificent divinity of it. And, and affirm, as your word says in Psalm 119, 89, that forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven, and it is pure and right. We can trust it. So, God, I pray this morning, as we look at Scripture together, as we think through this topic of bibliology together, Lord, I pray that you would affirm and strengthen and bolster our faith in your word, that not only would we, we, would we believe it, but that we would hunger for it. We would hunger to to walk with it and to to study it and to meditate on it so that we might know you, the God of this word, better and live in a relationship with you that's pleasing. And so, God, I pray that you'd bless our time this morning as we grow in that. In your name we pray, amen. Well, let's let's start with, and we're going to kind of ask a question with each of these different points. Let's start with the aspect of uh, of inspiration and the question is do you believe that the bible is inspired by god well, we have to start there um, and it's clear that paul in the new testament early church believed in the inspiration of scripture again as we just were here in first thessalonians 2 we're going to kind of use that to draw our outline from it and our points here today uh, where he praises them for receiving the word as not the word of men but the word of god and so I think the question need to be answered is, do you believe that the Word of God is completely and unquestionably from Him? And, and to help us answer that, we need to 
to consider the question, well, how did we get the word? How do we, how did we, how do we get the Bible in its form of 66 books? How do we, how do we, what's the process by which God has given that to us and then helps us to learn and to grow in that? And there's really three things that I want us to kind of consider in that uh, of what's brought it to us. And the first is the, actually the word of inspiration, that God inspired his word. And, um, and, and we saw that earlier in 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. He inspired it to us. That's why we, we said earlier in our belief that we believe in the verbal, plenary inspiration of scripture. And that, what that means is we believe that God didn't just inspire concepts and vagueness out there, But every word, if if Jesus said every jot and tittle will be fulfilled, the smallest markings uh, of the Hebrew language, if every detail of that is going to be preserved by God, then we know that God inspired every single word. He verbally inspired it. And plenary simply means all. It wasn't just parts of that. He inspired all of Scripture for us. And, And so... Um, and, and the word there for inspire, this inspiration, literally means divinely breathed. That God spoke it out, he breathed it out, uh, every word to us. Uh, Charles Ryrie defines inspiration as God's superintendence of the human authors, so that using their own individual personalities, they composed and recorded without error his revelation to man in the words of the original autographs. And what he's recognizing is another text in 2 Peter chapter number uh, 1 in verse 20 and 21 where Peter says, for no prophecy, we know this, that first that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so here's kind of the process of inspiration where God breathed it out, but he used human authors to pen it. And so there is going to be a distinctiveness to every book. Each author lived in a different time period and culture and had different educational backgrounds. And so you've got a guy like Luke who was a doctor. He's going to be very detailed. He was a historian. And so he's going to give us a lot of great detail. You're going to have a guy like Peter. Peter was a fisherman who who operated based on what he saw and he experienced walking with Jesus. And, And so... God uses these prepared men, and he speaks out his word through their writing. And so it's going to have that distinctiveness. And so, for instance, one of the ways we might think of that is, if I were to give each of you a different, uh, a different type of writing tool, to sum a marker, to sum a pencil, to sum a crayon, to sum a pen, and say, I want you to write out this verse. Now that verse is going to look distinctively different because of the instrument being used to write it out in the same way god chose the people he wanted to use as the instruments to breathe out his word to so we'd have what we have in the scriptures today and when it says there they they were moved by the holy spirit it means that they were they were influenced and born along carried along to write exactly what god wanted them to write and so, scriptures are penned to us by over 40 different men over a time period of about 1,500 years on three different continents and different cultures. And yet what we find is a book that is cohesively a unit that does not disagree or contradict itself as there is a harmony to it, which tells us that they were not, they were not conferring together. Moses was not conferring, I can guarantee you, with with Paul they were centuries apart and yet whatever they wrote is in perfect harmony it tells us that the author the designer of scripture is not Moses or Paul or Peter or Luke it's divine it's God God breathed it out to have harmony so therefore there is a great amount of of reliance and an expectation we have when we come to it The second aspect is not only did God inspire his word, but God preserved his word and continues to preserve his word, which is amazing when you consider all of the the contesting against it. 
the fighting the, and, and, and the attempts that Satan has tried to remove. And that's been from the very beginning. From the very beginning, Satan's attack has been on the Word of God. Think about it in Genesis 3. What's the very first thing that we see Satan saying to Eve? Did God really say you should not eat every tree of the garden? He's questioning, did God say this? Are you sure this is right? Are you sure that God said this? From the very beginning and throughout the course of human history, the battle that Satan has been having as the father of lies has been the battle over God's word. Because if he can undermine God's word, he can turn us away from serving God and obeying God and knowing God, and they will serve him. They'll serve themselves. And so that's been his efforts. And that's why when we think of this idea of inspiration, again, I, I mentioned earlier Psalm 119, 89, that says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. God's had that settled there. He's going to preserve that. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Or even Jesus said it this way in Matthew 24, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will will by no means pass away. So, this idea of preservation, to quote Thiessen in his systematic theology, he said this, when you understand that only a very small percentage of books survive more than a quarter of a century, that a much smaller percentage lasts for a century, and that only a very small number live a thousand years, we at once realize that the Bible is a unique book god has preserved it throughout millennia for us to have and god anticipated the battle would rage and continues to rage over his word and so satan is still up to that same same tricks i mean for example and we, we studied this even when we were looking through the studying the, the book of daniel uh, later on 175 bc the king of syria antiochus epiphanes ordered the jews on pain of death to destroy the scriptures and worship the Greek gods. But Judas Maccabees, a, a Jewish man, saved the books and led a revolt and won independence for the Jewish nation. Another is the, the Roman emperor Diocletian's order in 303 AD that he was going to kill as many Christians and destroy other Bibles as possible to return them back away from Christianity to worshiping the Greek gods. And he thought by the amount of people he had killed, by the amount of Bibles that, and, and scriptures that he had destroyed, he thought he had eradicated Christianity and removed the scriptures to the point that he actually had a, a medallion made to symbolize it. And he wrote this on the medallion. It says, the Christian religion is destroying the worship of the gods restored. But God had the, the next statement in it because the very next emperor, Constantine, actually established Christianity as the religion. And as... With that article, he ordered 50 new scriptures to be, manu or to be scribed out as part of that and legalized Christianity. But you realize that up until the 1300s, there was no Bible in the English language. Up until that point, the, the state church maintained the Bible in the Latin, which was not the common man's tongue. And so to understand, you could not read a Bible for yourself. You'd have to, to go to church and they would tell you what to think. Tell you how to interpret this because you couldn't read it. Well, there became a man by the name of, of John Wycliffe who had a desire to get the word of God into the, the common everyday man's tongue so that, so that you could have a Bible to read, to study for yourself. He began to, to, to make uh, manuscript copies of the scriptures into English, but he was translating them at that point from the Latin, which wasn't the best translation possible but that's what he had available he began to translate them and make copies of scriptures and to get them out to the common man's people and and he had he had uh, assistants that would work with him to do this it so angered the the state church that they they took Wycliffe and and had him killed uh for that in fact they were so angered that that 44 years after Wycliffe's death the pope ordered his bones to be dug up burned and spread on the river as a means of saying don't distribute the scriptures which is astounding when you think of that uh, one of his followers john huss that was one of the men who helped in the transcribing and and distributing the scriptures he continued that on after john wycliffe 
and was later taken and captured and was burned at the stake in, in 1415. And they used Wycliffe's manuscripts to actually light the fire to, to start the burning of the fire to burn John Huss at the stake. All because there was a desire to get the word of God out so that people could read it. And God knew this was going to be a battle throughout the centuries and throughout the millennia. In the 1400s, it seemed like the tide was turning in a good direction. You have a man by the name of Johann Gutenberg who developed the first movable print press, a mechanical press, which the first book that he ever printed on the press was the Bible. And it seemed like things were turning. There was a, there was a regathering of the, the original manuscripts and going back to the original Hebrew and, and the Greek and, and the collecting of those and then translating those and the process was going well. And then in the 1500s, they faced another really difficult uh, emperor by the name of Mary. She was known as Bloody Mary. And during her short five and a half years, she executed hundreds and thousands uh, of believers of Christians trying to, to remove the removal of Scripture and burned and, and, and many, many copies of Scripture in that process. But all through this, God promised that His Word was settled in heaven. He promised that He would preserve it for us. All throughout those years and all the different emperors and all the different societies and all that process, God even raised up in His people, the Jewish people, a great reverence for the Word of God that they were so meticulous and so careful that they would take such precautions even as they would go to transcribe and copy out the the hebrew that they would go and actually bathe themselves before they would write the name of god and they would then come back and would write it out and then if they came to it again they would go and bathe themselves again because they recognized the reverence of scripture and god established that in his people and they would collect it and and preserve it very carefully i discovered the dead sea scrolls in 1947 confirm uh, the veracity of those scriptures that went back into pre-christ era and 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 those scriptures actually reveal the the veracity and the accuracy of the old testament scriptures and so in fact sometimes people say well uh, is there really enough manuscript evidence to actually even say we should trust the bible i wanted to consider this this graph here the New Testament writings, and think of the time period from which the New Testament was written and the earliest manuscripts that we have, that the manuscripts are only 30 to 150 years from the time. So we have eyewitnesses that are transcribing. We actually have the, the scriptures from that period. But there's over 25,000 copies of those in various languages. We actually have, we actually have 5,686 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament but then in other languages of the Coptic, um, uh, the Syriac, the Latin, Aramaic languages, there's an additional over 19,000. We have over 25,000 copies of the New Testament scriptures. Think about, does anybody ever question whether Homer's Iliad is accurate? Written in 800, 800 B.C., the, the earliest manuscripts, 400 years later, and we have 1,700 of those. Or, or Aristotle's writings. Anybody question whether Aristotle write these writings? And the, the time gap is 1,200 years later. We're talking about copies of these things. That the, the closest date to them is 1,200 years later. And we've got 1,000 of those. And nobody questions Aristotle. Demosthenes, Caesar's Gallic Wars. A 1,000 years span, we have 250 of those. And yet we've got over 25 thousand copies of the new testament that tells us that god is going to preserve his word for us and we can trust it we can know it and stand upon that and so god breathed out in addition to the twenty-five thousand copies not to mention there's an additional over eighty-six thousand quotations from early church fathers from historical documents of the scriptures as they would quote scriptures in in the modern in, in their in their normal converses and in their normal writings what it tells us this is this is va- validated and been preserved so god breathed out his word and he inspired it and then he guaranteed it would be available for every generation they might know god they would know him through his word and have, be able to have a relationship that they would know the gospel 
that the gospel would continue to be going forward because God mandated he was going to protect his word, that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for our sins. So God, God inspired his word, he preserves his word, but then thirdly, he, he illuminates his word. The third process is getting the word of God to men, the process known as illumination, where God helps to understand this. He helps us to, to understand what he's saying so that we could, we could know who he is. And this is the process by which God uses the inspired written record of his revelation to speak to the hearts of individual people. This is when the Holy Spirit causes the, the light to come out in human hearts. Uh, the Bible says that, that the Holy Spirit would guide us into truth and your word is truth. That he helps us to understand it, to know it. So it's not just reading letters on a page it's not just reading sentences and be like i have no idea who god is i have no idea what this book says god says i'm going to give you my spirit who's going to help you to understand this you know what that tells us god wants us to know him we have a god who not only speaks it onto existence and created and fashioned you but he wants you to know him he wants you to know what's best for your life he has a purpose for your life he wants you to know how to live your life in a way that's pleasing to him and a way that will be purposeful and intentional. And so, thus, the, the, the process of, of God inspiring his word is completed in the fact that he inspired it, he preserves it, and he illuminates it to us. Now, again, I hope you're not all getting bored by this more of like an educational lecture um, this morning. We're going to get into more of the whys and get more of the nuts and bolts of that next week, a little more of an apologetic aspect and see some evidence, but it's important we lay down what does the Bible tell us and, and, and what, what does it expect us to believe, and then we'll look at how we can look at internal and external evidences for that as we go forward. And that, by the way, let me just say a word to parents. We need to be allowing our children to ask the questions. They're going to wonder why they believe certain things. We need to be able to look at and look at what evidence is there for these things. Why do we believe these things? And so it needs to be that they're able to, to, to grow in those things and learn those things in their home where they're being taught the scriptures and, and, and thinking through, well, why do we believe this or that? And be to ask the questions because I guarantee when they leave your home, and go off to college or go off to business, even whether that's a secular college or Christian college, it's going to be contested. And we need to know why do we believe what we believe? Why do we practice like this? Why do we live like this? And so we want to encourage that. This isn't just a blindly, well, this is the church's doctrinal statement, we just believe it because they say it. No, no. We want to encourage our, our young people and encourage each other to know why we believe what we believe. And so, again, we'll get into that a little bit more again next week. So, first question, though, is do you believe the Bible is inspired by God? The next question is in relating to inerrancy. Do you believe the Bible is without error? And I would say this is probably where the, the heat of, uh, of a lot of this is taking place as well in our society. But going back to our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Notice he says in verse 13, Paul recognizes that the word is not from men. He praises them that you welcomed it not as the word from men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. It's truth because it's the word of God. And so it is without error. And so here at First Baptist, we attest to believe that, that this is inerrant. And that, that word simply means it is absent of error. That it's going to be accurate in every instance. It's perfect. Sometimes we'll even use the term infallible. And that there's a difference. Inerrancy means that it is, is completely 100% perfect in every way. Infallible means it's incapable of ever being wrong. And, and so therefore even prophecy is incapably, incapable of being uh, in, inaccurate. Um, and it will always be truth. The scripture is in every sense perfect. And that they are a perfect revelation of the mind of God to man. So, so why do we believe this? Why do we believe that the Bible is without error? Why does Paul believe that? Why does he teach that and praise the Thessalonians for that? Well, it's really a simple syllogism if you think about it. A simple thought process. That if we believe in inspiration, 
that 2 Timothy 3.16, that God inspired out his words to us. And if we believe that God is sovereign and perfect and all-knowing and without error, he is perfectly holy in every aspect, then therefore what he inspires out, breathes out, must also be 100% perfect and without error, or else he's no longer God. And so if someone contests and says, well, I don't believe the Bible is accurate or is without error, then you're actually debating whether or not God is perfect and holy. And so there's the kind of the process of thinking in that. And so I appreciate what Phil Fernandez, the, the founder and president of the Institute of Biblical Defense, he said the basis of our evangelical faith is an inerrant Bible grounded in real history. Once evangelicals begin to deny inerrancy and remove biblical miracles from space-time history, reducing them to mere metaphors, then these interpreters cease to be evangelical. You can no longer really call yourself an evangelical Christian when you deny those things. So God has continually reiterated this truth in verses like Proverbs 30, verse 5, that every word of God is pure. He says it this way in in Psalm 19. We read this earlier in our scripture reading. That the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testament of the Lord is sure. It's a sure, right, perfect foundation. But that word perfect, the law of the Lord is perfect. means it is absent uh, of any error. It needs nothing else. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Psalm 12, verse 6 The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. So the Bible clearly teaches us that it is inerrant. The Bible teaches us that God inspired it out to us. And so we can trust it, we can have a confidence when we come to the scriptures that we know that we are reading what God wants us to know. We can know that this is, he's going to tell us how we ought to lead our families, how I ought to relate to people, how I ought to work, how I ought to manage my funds and my finances, how I ought to live my life in every aspect of my life. God has spoken, which leads us to our last point here, which is the question of authority. Do you believe the Bible is the final authority then for faith and practice, for faith and life, that that he has the right to tell us what is what we should be thinking. You know, so often I'm asked, what do I think about current issues? In fact, just in the last two weeks, I was asked what I believe about trans- transgenderism. I was asked what I believe uh, about um, uh, abortion and homosexuality, just regular current issues. And my, my answer is commonly the same, that it really doesn't matter what I think. But let's go back to what God has said. And we'll go back and I'll quote scripture. God has said this. Let's look at this text and these things. And because it doesn't matter what I think. I'm a nobody. I I have a fallible mind. I'm a fallible man. We need the answers from an infallible God. Who has a purpose and a plan. Who loves us and cares for us. Who designed us. And knows what he wants for for our world and for each one of us. And so it's. When he speaks as the creator, here's what it comes down to. It's the question of, is he or isn't he in charge? Is he truly the king? What I preached on for Easter, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Is it really his? Do we believe it? It comes down to authority on this. Do I, do I, does God have the right? To tell me how I should live my life. Someone once stated that God's word is not a book of suggestions. You know, it's not a matter of, you know, like Jesus questioned the Pharisees. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do the things that we say? Like, why? why? These, aren't, these aren't suggestions from God. Oh, you should obey this or do this. God's told us how to live our lives. And not because he's just trying to be restrictive and trying to make us have the worst life possible. In his presence is fullness of joy. As we walk with him and submit our lives to him and his word, there's where joy comes in. As a parent, 
you don't put you don't put restrictions and have rules in your home just because it's like well this will be fun well we're, as parents we're gonna get a lot of amusement entertainment about making our kids lives miserable kids i'm telling you they don't do that you may think that they do but they're not it's not entertaining them to them to make your lives miserable they do it there's rules there's guidelines because within those boundaries is the greatest place of peace and protection and and joy and it's it's for your good and it's the exact same way that god does with us he says i didn't write my word and give you the standards for life and practice just to be restrictive i want what's best for you i want where where you're, you're gonna have the greatest joy and you'll please me and so <clears throat> G. Campbell Morgan put it this way, so there is one sure and infallible guide to truth, and therefore one and only one corrective for error, and that is the word of God. You know, so, so linked really to this idea of authority is another concept that kind of links this called sufficiency. Is the scripture sufficient? The idea of sufficiency is that the word of God is everything we need in order to know God, to walk with him, and to please him. The Bible is sufficient to give us that standard of life. Notice what even Paul adds in our text here in 1 Thessalonians 2. Notice how he finishes out verse 13, where he says, The word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. The idea there of effectively works um, is where we get our word energy. It effectively works energizes the word is energized within us as we believe it as we as we yield our lives to it it energizes our lives to be purposeful and 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 have intention the way god desires for it that's that's what's good about it consider a couple of scriptures that tell us that second peter 1 3 as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness to the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. It, it gives us all things that pertains to life and godliness. Now think about, the state, think about the boldness of that statement. That the word of God gives us all things that pertain to life. You want to, like I just mentioned, you want to know how to handle finances? You want to know how to rest? How to work? All things that pertain to life and godliness are contained in the scriptures. Where, where Paul said in 2, Thessalon- or 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. It tells us what is right. It tells us what is the right things to believe and to, to live on. It's profitable for reproof. What's not right to correct us from what's not right. For correction, how to get it right. For instruction in righteousness and how to stay right. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped unto all good works. That's the idea of sufficiency. Everything we need to know. Listen, you don't have to go to Google to tell you how you should raise your children. You don't have to listen to Dr. Phil. You don't have to get some great book. And I'm not discounting books and that kind of stuff. But the final authority of sufficiency is Scripture. Now, I'm thankful for people who take Scripture and help us lay out on ideas like parenting or on ideas on, on how to have a husband and wife relationship or any of those things. But if they don't take Scripture and teach you from Scripture, then it's, it's pointless. We need to know what does God say about these things. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 8, 31, if you abide in my word, You're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Continue in the word, he says. Be a student of the word. Trust it because it's it's inspired by God. Trust it because it's inerrant. Trust it because he's preserved it, and trust it because it's authoritative and sufficient for your life. Do you remember back in 2014, Ken Ham, the, the director of Answers in Genesis, did a debate at the Creation Museum with Bill Nye, the science guy. And primarily that debate was over the, the issue of, of evolution and versus creation, and they were debating back and forth.
But at one point during that debate where, where Ken Ham and Bill Nye were going back and forth and Bill Nye was basically questioning a source of truth, Ken Ham said this, there is a book. And that became kind of a, a statement that got drawn out in, in a lot of the post-debate uh, articles was a, a, a highlight. There is a book. There is a book. Bill Nye, you may have all these things. And by the way, the book is scientific. The book is credible scientifically. We don't have to say, well, I have to choose between science and the Bible. There is a book who speaks scientifically. There is a book that speaks historically. There is a book that speaks archaeologically. There is a book. And God has given it to us to tell us how to live our lives. There is a book. And so in a society that is questioning where to look for truth, in a society that's questioning that we actually have truth, there is a book. It's a book that's given to us from God. We believe there is a God. He has spoken and he has not stuttered. There is a book. That's what this is about. I've got an authority for my life. I've got a resource for my life. I can know the God who created all things. He's given it to us in his book. And so hopefully as we think about this idea, this concept of bibliology, it's not just, you know, academic. There is an academic aspect of this. I realize that. But hopefully it's inspiring. There is a book that God has given us to know him. There is a book that he's given us to know how to live our lives in the way that would be most pleasing for him that tells me there's purpose for my life. And I look forward to his soon coming return that if I live according to this book, that my life will have been worth something. That I'll be rewarded and that there's a purpose I stand before him someday. That I've got hope because of this book and what it teaches me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray as we just think through just some of this concept of bibliology today, I pray that we'd be encouraged by that. But God, I pray as well that we would be motivated to dig into it, to be like the Bereans in the book of Acts that studied the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They would study it and, and apply it to their lives, that we would not just be students of the Word and hearers of the Word, that we'd be doers of the Word and apply it to our lives because we trust that you have breathed it out. It's inerrant. You've preserved it through the millennia, and it is authoritative for our lives. And so, God, thank you for your word. And I pray that we would trust it and love it and apply it. It's your name we pray. Amen. Well, I've asked the musicians to not come up just yet um, <clears throat> as we... Sorry, maybe you didn't get the memo. For just a moment, I want to I give a couple quick announcements real fast. Um, something I want to discuss with the church family. And, uh, <clears throat> and then they'll come up. And we'll, we'll do some singing at the end here. Um, <clears throat> just to kind of relay some things that are the elders and leadership have been talking through and um, we've been praying over and considering some specific needs within the church family as the church continues to grow and as we're dealing with different situations how to move forward and uh, some of the specific needs that we recognize that we've been praying about and is nursery space we're thankful for the amount of young people and kids and babies that are being born, but we're, we're limited on nursery space, and uh, there are times when just in a small room where the toddlers are at, there is 17 to 20 toddlers on around, and, um, and so that's becoming a crowded space. We also have been praying through with, a, with the aspect of a growing church body. We want to we maintain relationships. The church isn't just a place that you go to, it's a, it's a people that you are engaged with. And that means that we do life together. That means we know each other. We bear one another's burdens. We rejoice when one member rejoices, First Corinthians teaches us. And we, we weep when one member weeps. And there's got to be that relational aspect. And so we've been praying about how do we, as, a, as we continue to grow, maintain that and grow that. Uh, another thing we've recognized is, is that our, some of our space, even for in the foyer, is just so tight and limited. Uh, when... When you go to get your coat and then you feel like, man, I'm working through, get my coat and then got to try to get out of the way. It doesn't help us with trying to have time and space to, to, to get to know each other, to fellowship together. 
So some of the, those are some of the things we've been praying about and thinking about and discussing. And with that, there's two things that we are in the process of. And we want to announce them to you and have you be praying along with us. And one is regarding some building plans. We are working on some plans. We're not presenting to you today the plans, but we're working on some plans to move the building around in different places. And I'm going to describe a little bit to you for a moment here what we're looking to do. One of the things as well that we've heard a lot of times from moms and dads is that the nurseries seem a long way away, and if you're new, it's a little bit of a maze for the building. And so one of the things that we're looking to do is to take this upstairs educational wing that's going to become a children's wing. And it's going to have a nursing mother's room. It's going to have bathrooms there for toddlers. It's going to have the, the infants and toddlers and also our children's church rooms. So everything from infants up to third grade will be up here. It's going to be a locked down, an ability to lock that whole wing down for security purposes. It'll give a place where parents are close by and have that up here uh, in, a, in an easier location for moms and dads. Uh, and, and it allows us a lot more space, uh, which we didn't have in our current uh, nursery area. Uh, with that as well, uh, we would like to then move our current offices down to the nursery space. Um, I don't need a big office, and we can fit into there, and we'll make an office suite in that current nursery space, and, um, and we'll, we'll use that there. And then in addition, we want to then open up the foyer by, and, and the flow of traffic to that children's area by removing some of the walls into the main office now and out to the back hallway and make that area and the library area all part of the foyer. And open that all up, move traffic through to have coffee up here, have seating areas for people to, to build those relationships. To go get your children out of the nurseries or children's church and then come and grab a cup of coffee and sit in an area at a high top table to get a fellowship and talk and uh, to build those times and relationships and, and keep the traffic kind of moving in all these different areas that way. And we're going to have child check-in stations and, and all those things in that area. Again, we're working on those plans right now. We've been meeting uh, with an architect on that. In fact, all the leadership is again meeting tonight to look at the architectural plans to make some final um, adjustments to it. And then we're going to have final architectural plans drafted and drawn up. And then we're going to put this out to bid and hopefully um, have proposals to bring back to the church family by the end of the summer uh, with the full plans and to have the full pricing on this to take the vote. And then if all goes, continues that direction, then by third or fourth quarter of this year, beginning to do that renovation process. Um, and with that, we're looking at as, as well as we're moving some Sunday school classes, the potential of adding an elevator and working those things through for all ages. Another thing that, that we are working on this process is also developing time for that fellowship um, and there is a guy that tends to preach long that's, that's here, um, and I, you all got spoiled last week with John Lands, by the way. <laughs> that is totally unfair when a guest speaker comes in and preaches for 25 minutes. That is unreasonable. Um, so one of the things we like to do is to develop more time. What we found is when people are rushing because they've got to get to lunch, the kids are hungry, or they're, or they're hosting a lunch at their house, that they're rushing out the door. And so one of the things we're going to do is move things forward a little bit. Move Sunday school to 9 o'clock. It'll be a 45-minute Sunday school period and start the main service at 10 o'clock. That would be the service would be wrapping up around 11, 15. And it would give time to fellowship. You don't have to feel rushed to go get lunch. It also gives some moms and dads who feel like the afternoon is short for their kids to get home, get lunch, and, and then get a nap to have a little more time if they need to, to get them home, do that, to get back here for the evening services and children's ministry. Now, that's not starting immediately. That service time we're looking to start on June the 4th. So as we start into our summer schedule and things adjust, we're going to make that adjustment then. So starting in June 4th, that we'll be changing Sunday school to 9 o'clock, main service at 10 o'clock. And again, our, our objective is not just making changes for change sake. We want to continue growing together as a church family. We want to make things 
work for everybody together, build relationships, that, that we're able to exercise our spiritual gifts to one another and have that time and place and space to do that. And so I want to just give you an update. There are some of the things that our leadership has been praying through and working on and discussing and um, seeking the Lord's wisdom on this that will be best for our church family. So if you have questions, you can feel free to talk to any of our elders on that. We'd be happy to answer questions and talk it through with you. On the building plans, there's a, there's a variety, the, the deacons, the trustees, nursery coordinators, different people that are all involved in that process as we're looking at plans uh, for that. And so we're excited about it. I hope that sounds exciting. I, know, I hope for some parents you're saying, well, that sounds exciting to have the kids right here um, and, and for those things. And so we look forward to bringing back actual proposals to you uh, here in the near future. And so we ask for you to be praying about those things. And, uh, and, and look for, let me just say this as well with even the objective of this, look for opportunities to meet new people. Look for opportunities to build relationships. Sometimes that might be sitting in a different place in church. Might be trying to find somebody to say, hey, how are you doing? How can we talk? Or can we spend a little bit of time to talk? Being intentional in those relational aspects of, of church family. So that's, that's what I'm going to bring before you. So now I'm going to ask the, the musicians to come on up and we'll close out in some song. Um, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask us on those. We'd be happy to talk those through. And we want to remind you to be back tonight for our evening services. And uh, <clears throat> looking forward to being together as we continue to, to serve and worship the Lord together. Let's stand to our feet as we sing a closing song and get dismissed. Let's sing together, holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy.